If you have your Bible, I hope you do. You don't go to war with no weapon. And we war. We're warring. Amen. This is not a police action. This is a war we're in tonight. Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians 6 and verse 12. Some of you had an M1. Some of you had an M16. Some of you had an M14. That's what I had. Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse number 12. The scripture says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Father, bless this holy book to the hearing of the people, and give me unction to preach it tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Amen. Tonight I'll preach you a message, the powers that we face. For the Bible says over here in verse number 12 that we are face principalities and powers. These are powerful entities that we come up against. It's not a joke and it's not a game. No, a lot of folks get the idea that because things are going smoothly right now, that's the way it's going to be. But you are in a, a mortal combat. And, it's not, it's, and, and, and most Christians that I've known down through the years don't take their side of the combat as seriously as they ought to. You must ever be diligent. You must ever be diligent. You must ever be diligent. One of the first things they taught me when I went in the military, and this is the motto in there, is be prepared. Be prepared. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. And so uh, a Christian should, could, should certainly be prepared. Be ready. And the greatest weapon you have against Satan is that book you hold in your hand. If, the devil has, if, if Satan has put doubt in your mind as to the veracity of this book, the authenticity of this book, the power of this book, then he's already undermined your faith and your power against Satan. The Word of God is what Christ quoted to the devil, Matthew chapter number 4. When he came against him, he quoted Scripture. He didn't say a word about how he felt. When you go back and read what happened there, everything he said, he was quoting Scripture. And the reason he quoted the Scripture is because there is power in the Word of God. So the Bible said the Word of God is quick and powerful. So we are in a death struggle. And sad to say, I see good people, I see good Christians. I've seen good Christians that I know that love the Lord, but I watch them sometimes as they begin to falter and as they begin to yield to the, power, the unrelenting, unrelenting power of hell that comes against them. Satan may move away for a little season as he did Christ, but he'll always come back. And sometimes when he comes back, he comes back more vicious than he did when he left. So here's what you have to deal with. In the book of Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse number 23, here's what the scripture says. Ephesians 4, 23. Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse number 23. Watch carefully. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Your mind is the, is the, is the battlefield. Put it that way. The way a man thinketh, what a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you have a defeatist, self-pity, whining attitude, Satan is going to take that, destroy you with it. I am more than a conqueror through Christ that loved me. The immediate circumstances may not look like it. I may not feel like it, but the Bible says I've already won the battle. It's been won at Calvary. He has equipped us, and my friend, there's no, nothing Satan can do if once you stand your ground and, 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 and tell Satan straight to his face if you have to, I am more than a conqueror yeah. through him that loved me. Amen. The battle in the mind, ill how it rages. This is why there's so many things today that affect your mind, your thinking. You're being fed constantly, not only from, from that which you're conscious of, but the subliminal messages. 
that are being fed into you all the time, being fed into your mind, and these are to undermine your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, listen carefully. This is absolute truth. It is not relative truth. It is not populist truth for this culture today. It is, not, it is not something that is here today and gone tomorrow and that you just take what you need out of it. It is the absolute truth that I judge everything by, the Word of God. That means that my school teacher, my professor, my boss, my wife, my husband, my children, uh, my friends, uh, my co-workers, it makes no difference. I judge them by the Word of God. The book is the book and is forever settled in heaven. In the, in the book in 1 John, chapter number 2 and verse 16, this is another power that you have to deal with. In 1 John, chapter number 2 and verse number 16, in 1 John 2, 16, the scripture says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. You hear the old timers talk about worldly things. How many ever heard that? Don't expect to hear it in one of these emerging churches. <laughs> you won't hear anything about worldliness. So what does that mean? That means that a person that is worldly is an individual that is so full of the world that they have any time left for Christ. They got no time left for the Lord, no time left for the Bible, and no time left to pray. They're full of themselves. They're full of the world. The lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and the lust of the flesh. And that's what they live for. And we all have a problem with that. Amen. We've all got to deal with it. Yeah. And so that is a powerful thing trying to tear you down. And that's the world. The world is not your friend. Amen. Sad to say that you live in a culture in America that is anti-Christ now. Yeah. They call America a post-Christian nation. And that's certainly true. And it, the culture that you're part of right now in America is anti-Christ and anti-family. And it is an amazing thing at what's happening with the anti-family, anti-Christ movement. Let me give you just a little bit of what's going on. The, the Democrat Party in this country is bringing illegal aliens into this country by the millions. And they're bringing them into this country so that they can get their votes and they can take the jobs away from Americans. Listen, the Republican Party, through multinational corporations, through multinational trade agreements, is sending the jobs overseas. And they're taking the jobs away from Americans. Both parties, Democrat and Republican, wouldn't give you a dime for either one of them. And what you need to be looking for now in this next election, election is somebody that'll stand against the status quo and come back for the American worker and the American way of life. 1946, the country I was born into at that time was considered a Christian nation. You never heard anybody publicly get up and run Christ down. You never heard that when I was a child. I want to see that kind of country again. Amen. Amen. The world. 1 Peter chapter number 5 and verse number 8. 1 Peter 5, 8. You've got to deal with this one. Be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. How do you resist him, preacher? Steadfast in the faith knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. I've watched God's people suffer in this world just like unsaved people. I've watched them go through the same trials, the same problems, the, the same. And so don't let, don't let anybody ever kid you that just because you're saved that you're exempt from the problems of this world. No, we have the same problems. But what they don't have and I have is Christ. I've got the Lord to go with me through it. Devil, Satan, as I say again, will work on your mind. He will make you think in the back of your mind that you've got a covenant with God and, and a covenant with God that exempts you from the stuff that other people are going through. And that's okay until something happens to your family. 
And if it's your little girl in intensive care or your little boy in intensive care or it's a, it's, it's a mother, a father, a husband, a wife and it just comes out of nowhere, Satan is going to stand right there with you and he's going to say, where's your God? Amen. He wants to destroy your faith. Yeah. Dear Christian friend, most of the people that I've pastored for 40 years in a church are not filthy, lascivious, godless, uh, a bunch of hell-raising devils out here on the street. Most of them live reasonably clean lives. That's what I've experienced in the years that I've been in the ministry. What I have found in the ministry is that Satan doesn't have to come at you with that. What he comes at you with is to destroy your faith. Because he knows as a Christian, that's what you're standing on. He wants to destroy your faith. And if you will study what happened to Christ in the wilderness, he came to him and said, if thou be the son of God, it is written, turn these stones into bread. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, it is also written, thou shalt live by the word of God. Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God and not by bread alone. Amen. He quoted the scripture. And that's what we've got to do if we're going to deal with Satan. 1 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse 1. 1 Timothy 4, 1. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now in the next week or two or month, you're going to hear about another unbelievable murder take place in this country. Just the other day, a young man got up and took a shotgun and shot his family to death. Why? Because they made him stop watching a video game. He shot him to death. We have raised a whole generation that is completely detached from reality. They spend their lives in these arcade games. They fantasize as being part of what's going on. And they are out of touch with the real world. They live in this, they live in this cyber world. And it's a horrible thing because it is, t it, is, it is literally sucking the very life out of a whole generation of people. I marvel at how many times teenagers, teenagers in America will take a gun and kill their whole family. It's not isolated anymore. It happens all the time. Why is it happening, preacher? Because this is the progression of a number of generations that have departed from the Word of God, and the generation that's coming on now has absolutely no anchor whatsoever. No anchor at all. What do you think Satan is going to do with them? What do you think he's going to do with them? What do you think he's going to do with them? Here in the book of 1 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse number 1, Doctrines of devils, seducing spirits, demonic possession, demonic manifestations, demons everywhere. I put a lot of time, a lot of time in researching what's happening in the spirit world right now in America. It is an amazing thing how that one family can live in a house and not have any problems. Another family can move into the same house and blood will start coming out of the walls. Scratch marks appear on the walls. Doors open and shut. All kinds of supernatural manifestations. Here's what I'm learning. I'm learning that the supernatural manifestations are person specific. In other words, the kind of person that happens to be on the scene that's why a certain spiritual manifestation takes place. In plain words, if you are a filthy, wicked, godless, Christ-rejecting blasphemer, these demons are going to gather and congregate around you, and you're going to see manifestations that you don't want to see, and you're going to see stuff begin to happen in your life you don't need part of. Why? The old-timer said, birds of a feather flock together. And that's what's happening. It's an amazing thing how some people can live for decades in the woods and never see a Bigfoot. 
others can see him right off the bat. The spiritual, spiritual world can leave physical evidence. Remember, when Moses and Aaron went before Pharaoh, cast down their rod, it became a serpent. When Janus and Jambres, probably the names of the two that showed up, cast their rod down, what happened? That was a physical reality. It became a serpent. And Moses' rod that was a serpent swallowed up their rod or their serpent, right? But you cannot deny the fact that it was a serpent. No, carefully. These are magicians. These are people that are into the occult world. All of Egypt was all occult. And they were coming against the power of God. And the Lord had a reason for that becoming a serpent. God knew before it ever happened that that serpent that God had made there would swallow up their serpent. That was a confrontation that took place. He meant for it to take place. He wanted it to take place. But he's preaching something to us. There is a reality in this stuff. And keep this in mind. <clears throat> you will have come against you a spiritual power that is far greater than you. But the one that is in you is greater than anything that can come against you. If a witch hates you, she may try to cast a curse on you, hex you, or a warlock or something of that nature. They may try to call evil spirits and conjure them up to try to destroy you. I'm glad, thank God, that when I lay my head on my little bed, that I wrap that blanket around me and I just turn over and I go to sleep whether the creaking and the cracking and the ghost and the, amphi and the apparitions and the haints and all the rest of them are coming and going, I don't know. But I'm sleeping. Yeah. Yeah. But every once in a while, I'll see one. Yeah. And the other day, one appeared at the bed, probably because of what somebody might have been doing. I don't know. But I said, you unclean spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, leave my bedroom right now. I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm saved. My name's written in heaven, and I'm covered by the blood, and it just vanished. Amen. Now, you can say I'm crazy. That's okay. I'm about half crazy most time anyway. That doesn't bother me. But I'll tell you one thing. It woke my wife up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning when he, she hears her husband next to her talking. She wants to know who I'm talking to. Go ask her. <laughs> Who are you talking to at 3 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> I'm talking to this demon standing right here next to my bed. And it left. Amen, Amen brother. Amen. Amen. I, I, you know, I don't make out tonight like I'm some big thing, but I'll tell you this. They know I'm up here in this pulpit preaching. They know I'm up here teaching on Sunday morning. They know I'm up here. They know what I'm doing. They know that I'm in the ministry. They know that I'm doing this every day of my life. I'm either preaching or I'm teaching or I got my nose in a book or I got my nose studying somewhere trying to get something so I can, so I can give it out. And that's what my life is about. And they know that. And if they can come against me and destroy me, they will. But they're not going to do it by the grace of God. Hallelujah to God. Not going to do it. It's not going to happen. But I try to learn as much about them as I can. And that's one of the things that I'm beginning to learn. It's beginning to see. And it's, and it's beginning to open up doors for me to be able to research in different directions because I believe that most of what goes on today when people see something, it is person specific. Yes. Because another person can be in the same place and see nothing. Yeah. See what I mean? Amen. This Amityville horror. Do you know the story about that? This, where was it? New York, New Jersey, somewhere up in there. This, they made a movie about it. Yeah. All this stuff that went on, well, these people in that house experienced all of this, but they moved out of the house, and another couple bought the house. Now, <laughs> I wouldn't have been the one buying that house, but they bought the house, moved into it, and do you know what? Check into it for yourself. Nothing happened. Not a thing happened. You know why? Different people. That tells me something. That tells me a lot. Different people. Amen, amen. So if you got demons chasing you all the time and you got a problem with evil spirits, all maybe you need to get in a hole somewhere and shut the door and get on your knees and get a hold of God. Yeah. There may be something going on in your life that they know all about. Yeah. What does the Bible say about give no what place to the devil? Did the Lord Jesus Christ say the prince of this world cometh and hath no part in me? See so what I mean? An open door, access into your life. Amen, folks. <laughs> Amen. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter number 2 and verse 17. 
I just got kicked out of the ministerial association. I'll never have me again up to speak to them. Amen. That crazy guy down there, I mean, there's no way we can, we can be refined and, and have him around. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I wear his badge of honor. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter number 2 and verse number 17. Now watch this. Their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Now I was standing outside talking to some men before I came in here tonight. They were talking about some of the churches, the people they work with, and people who go to churches and what have you. They were talking about simple things, two simple things tonight, two simple things. Number one, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the God-man. How many believe that? Yeah. They never heard it in their churches. Huh. Number two, ye must be born again. Yeah. How many believe that? Yeah. They never heard it in their churches. Huh. Now, how could you call yourself a Christian church and not believe that Jesus Christ is God Almighty in flesh? Amen. You say, you wear it out, preacher. No, I don't. Don't preach it enough. Amen. It ought to be preached 24-7. And you must be born again should be preached 24-7. Why? Because you must be born again. The new birth. The new birth is not a Baptist doctrine. The, the doctrine of the, of the Godhead that Jesus Christ, the Bible said in Colossians, in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Lord Jesus Christ is God himself in flesh, folks. But the new Bibles, the NIV, and, in the, and, and many of that in 1 Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. What does your Bible say? God was manifest in the, in the flesh. What does the NIV say? He who was manifest in the flesh. That is a direct assault against the Godhood of Christ. Direct assault. And the thing about you must be born again. How many of you then follow me on Wednesday night as I talk about the Gospel of John and set it over here against the so-called synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and show you the great difference in the Gospel of John. It's the last of the Gospels to be written. It's not written about the kingdom of heaven. It's not written with the kingdom of heaven's, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, constitution. The Gospel of John is written that you might believe, and it is not addressed to Jews. The Gospel of John, for whosoever will. And this is why of all of the Gospels, all four of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, only John says, you must be born again. Amen. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. I remember my pastor, Bill Carter, when I was at Third Creek Baptist Church. I was a baby in Christ, didn't know anything, but I was hungry. And I remember him one time, he had, a, he, had a, he had a preacher come in there and preach a revival meeting. I don't forget, I don't remember who he was, but I remember that preacher made this statement. And that's, I, it'll stick with, it stuck with me for over 40 years. He said, that preacher, after a service was over with, he left out of that church and that woman came up to him and said, now preacher so-and-so, why is it that every time you get up in the pulpit and you preach that you must be born again, why do you do that? Don't you, you're wearing it out. He said, lady, you must be born again. <laughs> Amen. 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 If you miss that, folks, you've missed, all, you've missed it all. Amen. Amen. So religion is an issue that you have to deal with. Religion. Organized religion. Amen. So what is your defense? What is your defense? Look at Matthew chapter number 4 and verse 4. Matthew 4, 4. He answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen. Amen. Now, for you folks that were in Sunday school this morning, you know that as I taught in Sunday school this morning, do you remember? I told you how that for 1,500 years on this earth before the flood, there was no written record. And I told you how that 1,400 years before Christ, Moses wrote the Pentateuch. Right. But then I also told you that about 1900 B.C., roughly 1900 B.C., the book of Job was written. And the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. The oldest book in the Word of God is the book of Job. And some believe, and I won't argue with them for a minute, some believe that Job's the oldest book on earth. That it's the oldest of all the books written by anyone. And uh, being a Bible believer, I say amen. I can't prove that, but I, that's the direction I would head. All right, here's the point. What did men do for a thousand, two, almost 2,000 years before the Word of God was written down. 
God gave himself a witness, Romans chapter number 1. He gave himself a witness in the heavens. There is a witness in the heavens. As a matter of fact, the book of Romans is a wonderful book. And here's why. The book of Romans starts out with a person believing and what, they're, what they have to believe by. Chapter 1. Chapter number 2, it goes to the heathen that don't have the written word of God. They don't have the law, but they've got a conscience. God judges them by that. Chapter number 3, he goes into the Jew who professes to be a light to profess to be a leader of the blind, to profess to be, you know, have this great knowledge of God. And in the third chapter of Romans, the Lord says through the apostle Paul, you say you have all of this, but that's not the way you live. God's going to judge you by the kind of life you live. What good is it for you to be a Jew if you don't practice the things that you say you believe? Then when you get into the fifth chapter of the gospel of uh, the book of Romans, the fifth chapter of the book of Romans lays the foundation for the rest of it. For the fifth chapter of the book of Romans says, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. The apostle is laying the foundation for what follows throughout the rest of the book of Romans. He camps, he, he puts everybody together and says, in Adam all die, but in Christ they shall live. Then when he gets down to the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, he said, the word is nigh thee, even in thy heart and in thy mouth. That is the word of faith, which we preach. That if thou shalt believe in thine heart that Jesus Christ died, rose from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So the 10th chapter of Romans is the salvation chapter. Amen. Amen. Romans is a complement to the gospel of John. They go together, they fit together like a glove. Because Romans lays down the theological foundation for belief and the gospel of John lays down the practical application of it when you receive what he said. And in the gospel of John chapters number 14, 15, and 16, he said, when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. That's the Holy Ghost guiding us into salvation. Amen. Hallelujah to God. So the word of God is written not to confuse you, not to get you, not, to, uh, not even to condemn you because every man's condemned by his own conscience. Remember when the Lord wrote in the dirt, being condemned by their own conscience. The word of God is written to make you free, to give you the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, he is the only savior of mankind. Yes. I don't care what your religion is. There's only one name under heaven given whereby we must be saved. Amen. That's the blessed name of the blessed one, the blessed lamb of God. Yes. Glory to his holy name amen. forever and ever and ever is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. Amen. So the word of God is the primary foundation that you have to go against this. In 1 John chapter number 2 and verse number 27, here's an element of it. This is the way to look at it, and this is important. 1 John chapter number 2 and verse number 27. Notice who wrote 1 John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Who wrote that? John. Same, same one that wrote the gospel. Same one. Not John the Baptist, but John the Apostle. All right. 1 John 2, verse 27. The anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. You need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things and is truth, and he is no lie, even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Therefore God has given us this great shield, this great blessing, this great unction that we can open the Bible if we are truly born again, and he will teach us from the scripture and write it in our hearts. Amen. In plain words, you can take a baby in Christ that's just been born again, hand him a Bible, stick him on an island out here somewhere with no Bible colleges, no teachers, no preachers, no nothing, just him and the Bible, and God will lead him into the truth. He'll guide him into it. Now, he's already saved, but you know, saved is the first fruits. The apostle Paul said you should be teachers of others, but you have need that one teach you because you've forgotten the first principles of the oracles of Christ. Salvation is the beginning, and there's much to be built upon that. And we've got to build upon, build upon it or our faith will always remain infantile. It'll be like a child. It'll be, it'll be subject to our feelings. It'll be subject to, 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 the, to the effects of, of men who can lord over us. The more you grow in Christ, the more you realize that you are a royal priesthood. 
that no man's going to come up and wear some robe in front of you and say he stands between you and God. That's not going to happen. There, no, no, no. One God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. This is why the Catholic Church for centuries kept the people illiterate, kept them ignorant, and then they had the mass in Latin. So all they were left with was the priest because they didn't have a clue what he was saying. They couldn't read the Bible on their own. And so they were completely dependent upon, upon a priest class to guide them and lead them. And that's sad. That's sad. I mean, that's really sad. Illiteracy is a terrible curse. It is. To be able to read is a wonderful blessing, folks. Don't get mad at your teacher when she's trying to teach you how to read. <laughs> That's one of the, I saw a bumper sticker the other day said, if you can read this bumper sticker, thank a teacher. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> Amen. John chapter number 14, verse 17. John 14, 17. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. A few Wednesday nights ago, I took the word truth and ran it through the Gospel of John. And what you literally have here is that ye shall know the Christ, the person of the Lord Jesus. He is the truth personified. And if you know him, he'll make you free and guide you into all truth. That's what that means. I'm glad for that. When the Holy Ghost, if it's the real Holy Ghost, there's a lot of ghosts that aren't. If this is the Holy Ghost, how many of you know that? How, how do you know that? How many of you understand? I've gone through this before. How many of you know the difference when the New Testament uses ghost and spirit? It'll use spirit in one place and ghost in another. There's a reason for that. See, I thought they were the same, interchangeable. It uses ghost in one place and spirit in another. Now, my grandfather was very superstitious, and I grew up in a home with a man who was born in 1878. Jesse James was still robbing banks in 1878. Okay, I grew up in that home. I was blessed in a lot of ways because I go back many generations into the past. My grandfather was very superstitious. He looked out for Hanks. You laid his hat on the bed, you're gonna get in trouble. He gives you a knife open, you better give it back to him open. You don't, you, you, I mean, he's got all kinds of things. And I, and I mean, he got, he got mad over this stuff. And I didn't know any different. I thought everybody was like that. <laughs> because that's the way it was in our home. All right. Now, let me tell you something. Those old timers saw things in a spirit world that a lot of people don't see today until they get off in this stuff that I was preaching about earlier. Okay. They don't get into it. This text right here in John chapter number 14 says the spirit of truth will guide us into all truth. A ghost in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit is called the Holy Ghost in the New Testament because he comes back into this world as the spirit of Christ. He doesn't come saying I'm the Holy Ghost. He comes as the spirit of a man who was dead, buried, and rose again. If you have not the spirit of Christ, you're none of his. So the New Testament writers, whether they are conscious of it or not, would use spirit in one place and ghost in another. Don't ever let anybody tell you that the King James Bible, because it uses the term ghost, is anachronistic. In other words, out of time, that it's old, that it's, you know, it, it belongs to a time of superstition and all of that. Don't ever let them tell you that. You'll find that when you see words that differ, but they're translated from the same word, pneuma, pneumatos, when you see words, that are see words that are translated differently from the same word, ask God to show you why there's a difference. And you'll be amazed that sometimes it'll open up a great blessing to you. And it'll make you love your Bible that much more and appreciate it. So when the New Testament uses the term ghost, leave it alone. Leave it alone. Amen. Leave it alone. Because he's trying to show you something Amen. in the scripture. And then this power that you have over the enemy. 
Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 13. Ephesians 2, 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off. Now let's hold on for just a moment before we go any further. Who's he talking to? Is he talking to Jews? No, he's talking to Gentiles. Yeah. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by your good works. No. Did I mess up? Yeah. Y'all caught me. Yeah. What does it say? By the blood, by the blood, by the blood. Now, how many of you have ever touched the blood of Christ? Never touched it, have you? You haven't even never touched it. And everything I say tonight, I say it with the deepest respect and awe of the blood that was shed. Why is that blood so important? When he took the cup and said, this is the what of the New Testament? Of the new what? The New Testament. Stop just a moment now. Hakene diatheke is the Greek word translated testament, but it's also translated covenant. Hakene diatheke. The Greek word diatheke means to cut through, all right? Dia, a diameter, cut through, all right? Hakene diatheke. This is the new testament in my blood. Had it been shed yet? No. The new testament had not come into a force yet. When did it come into force? When, it, when was it ratified? When did it become binding and powerful? At the death of Christ. Without the death of the testator, the testament is not in force. Amen. All right. We got that. So what does it mean? Think about it for a minute. He uses covenant, especially in the book of Hebrews, as it relates to the Jewish people. Same word, but instead of translating it testament, he translated covenant. Hebrews chapter number 8, this is the hakene diatheke that I will make with the house of Israel. He did not say, this is the testament that I will make with the house of Israel, did he? He said, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. But when it comes to the Gentiles like us, hakene diatheke, same Greek word, he doesn't call it a covenant. He calls it a testament. That immediately opens the door. That immediately will make you think. Well, why wouldn't he just be consistent? Not him, the speaker, but the translator. Why would not the translator just translate hakene diatheke, either testament every time or covenant every time? See, this is what you get into when you translate the Bible. Why don't they just, why aren't they consistent? Same thing with ghost and spirit. There's something going on. So what's going on, preacher? Well, let's think about it for a minute. Testament for the Gentile Covenant for the Jew. The covenant people. There you go. They're the covenant people. Yes. Who? The Jew. Yes. This is the covenant that I will make with them, with the house of Israel. Hebrews 8. Read it when you get home tonight. This is the covenant that I make with the house of Israel when I take away their sins. Hebrews 8. When's he going to do that? Has he done that yet? See, you've got, you've got good people, post anomalist out there, and they're good people. But they, they try to say that the church has replaced Israel. No way. See, they say the church has replaced Israel. God's finished with the Jew and Israel once and for all and forever. It's over with. I don't believe that. No don't believe it for a minute. I believe the day is going to come when the new covenant, the blood covenant yeah. of the Lord Jesus Christ will be brought to bear on the Jewish people. And they'll acknowledge him as their Lord and their Savior. But that doesn't explain testament. Now, have you, how many of you have ever been to a, you know, when a loved one passes away and they read the, uh, they, they, have a, they, have a, uh, uh, they have a last will and testament and you go in there and you, everybody's trying to figure out who got the most. <laughs> and that's where the dog fight starts because <laughs> one gets more than the other and you start getting hair jerked out and everything under the sun. You know what they're fighting over? They're fighting over the last will and testament of that individual. All right? That testament speaks of what they are giving to this individual. He gave us the benefits of the blood covenant. Because there's only one blood covenant. There's only one shedding of blood. Not two, not three. Just one, folks. And it was sufficient for the sins of the whole world. Yeah. The Lamb of God, yeah. the Lamb that sheds its blood, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. 
one blood covenant. But the Holy Spirit is so particular about this that he calls your attention to the fact that you will benefit of the blood covenant, but your part is going to be called a blood testament, a new testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so when I take that and I come under that, I'm saying to myself, my goodness, I believe every demon in hell knows what the blood covenant is. I believe they were there watching him when he died. I believe they understood by going back centuries how that blood was necessary. There was no forgiveness of sins. That every artifact of the tabernacle was consecrated by blood. The blood was necessary or it couldn't be set aside. It couldn't be consecrated. So if God applied the blood to the high priest, and he did. He did. He applied the blood to the high priest. And it's a beautiful thing. It's such a beautiful thing because... He could not go into that holy place and burn offerings and offer prayers until the blood had been applied. And once the blood was applied, he could go back and approach God. And it's the same with us tonight. Blood doesn't mean that we're washing around in a blood pool and that we were in a slaughterhouse religion. It means that there is a covenant that God has made with mankind And that covenant is based entirely upon a blood sacrifice. And is the blood sacrifice of a pure lamb of God, sinless before God. And that blood covenant, that blood covenant trumps every other covenant. There is nothing that can, there's nothing that can do away with that blood covenant. Nothing, nothing can do it. Nothing can touch it. If you come under the blood covenant, you are safe and secure. And not only are you safe and secure, the blood will wash your sins away. (laughs) And that's what he's talking about in Revelation 1.5. So what does that mean for me in practical terms, preacher? That means that, like I said, that that demon that showed up at my bed, I'm saved. I know the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't belong to you. I belong to him. I at one time lived where you live, but I don't live there anymore. The blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed my sins. I plead that blood against you, devil, against you, demon. I plead the blood against you. If you're a real believer and that is what you believe, you stand on that blood covenant, they've got to go. Because it's no longer between them and you. It's between them and him. And that's what it has to be. Or you're dead in the water just like that. Don't ever think that you've reached the point of separation and and sanctification and all that you think you are and think that you can come personally against Satan or a demon. They'll sift you like wheat. But if you plead the one who died on the cross and his precious blood for you, and that demon has to deal with him, not me, he'll go. He'll go. We may not believe in that in this world, but believe me, the spiritual world does. They know what they're dealing with. I'm going to give you five things tonight to let you know how if Satan is sifting you, this is what's going on in your home, your your family, your life, your spiritual condition. Number one, you're wallowing in self-pity. You wallow in self-pity. I don't know of anything that could happen to anybody in this world, really, that will tear you down any faster than self-pity. Self-pity. Woe is me. Look how terrible they've been to me. Richard Nixon got on the airplane out there decades ago. And what, how did he do it? Was it like this? And right before he got on that airplane, he said, they ain't going to have me to kick around anymore. (laughs) He did. He said that. They're not going to have me to kick around anymore. Self-pity. Number two, you hide behind people. If you're hiding behind people, then it shows me right there that your life is very unstable. Number three, you make excuses for the sin that is destroying your life and the life of your loved ones. Are you, have you found yourself making excuses for sin? Number four, you're bitter and defeated. If you're bitter, let me tell you something. I, I'll give you just a little bit of friendly advice tonight. If you want to get rid of all your friends, get yourself in a state of bitterness and complaining And I'll guarantee you, they'll all go in separate directions. Nobody wants to be around somebody that's bitter and full of complaining and self-pity. Nobody. You don't want to be around that. That'll wear off and people don't want it. And then the very thing that you preached about, you're now doing. Think about that for a minute. 
the very thing that you preach about. You know why? It's because if you find yourself constantly enamored with the way somebody's living or with what they have, it is because secretly deep down in your soul you want what they've got and what they're doing. But in order to, posit, to, to bolster your, your perceived condition, you run it down and you condemn it. But the truth of the matter is, that's what you really want. Amen. Amen. That's what you want. Amen. And you know something? All of us are subject to that. And so I got me a hole to crawl into. And I got a hole to get into and start talking to God. And that's the only way that I can stay right. Is talk to the Lord. And I talk to him every occasion, places I never imagined. I'm talking to God, talking to him all through the day, talking to him all the time. Talking to him when I'm going up the steps, talking to him when I sit down to eat, talking to God when I'm doing something, talking to him, talking to him. I think that's good. The Bible said, pray without ceasing. Father, in thy holy name, Lord, I pray you'd use what I've said tonight. Help somebody. In Jesus' name, as we open up the book and how much you've blessed me from it. Lord, you've blessed me from this blessed, blessed book. In Jesus' sweet holy name we pray. You know my heart tonight, Lord. You know some folks that are precious to me. And I'm praying for them. You know them. You know what the need is. We got folks in here tonight, Lord. They love their family. They love their children. They love their husbands and wives. And their mothers and fathers. But they know they're not right. And they're praying for them. And I pray along with them. Father, help us to bear one another's burdens. Help us, our Heavenly Father, to get our minds and our eyes off ourselves and focus them on the Lord Jesus. In his holy, righteous, sweet, blessed name I pray. And for Jesus' sake I ask it. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's stand up tonight, brother. Thank you.